Good afternoon and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about the Jack Kent Cook Foundation's Young Scholars Program. My name is Cindy Ayala, and I am part of AVID's marketing team. I would like to introduce my co-host, June Falyard, who is the Director of Scholarship Programs at the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. I'd also like to introduce Erin Madsen, who is part of AVID's marketing team and is here helping with the chat. During our time together, June will share more about the Young Scholars Program, including the application process and what the program itself is like. We will open it up for a question and answer session after that. This is where you can ask any questions you may have about the program or the application process. A few logistics before we begin. If you have questions as we move through this webinar, please use the Q&A feature towards the bottom of your screen. We will answer questions you submit, and if there are any that we don't get to, we will include the answer in a follow-up email. We will be using the chat to share information with you. We welcome you to use the chat. If you have any technical issues that come up, we are here to support. And we will record this webinar and send you the link so you can rewatch it or share it with anyone who is not able to attend today. Now, June will share more about herself and about the Young Scholars Program. Hi, everyone. Like Cindy said, my name is June Folliard. I'm the Director of Scholarship Programs at the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. I'm here to talk about the Cook Young Scholars Program. I've been with the foundation for about 16 years um, and now oversee our eighth grade through graduate school program. Um, but before that, I was an educational advisor in the Young Scholars Program and also was the manager of the Young Scholars Program. So um, I love talking about the program, about how to apply and all of that. Today, I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> the foundation a little bit, just to give you an idea, an overview of the foundation, um, what the experience is like in the actual program for young scholars, what the eligibility and criteria are to apply to the actual program, how one can complete an application to the Young Scholars Program, and then a little bit about applicant support for anyone who is interested and might have more questions. Um, and like Cindy said, there'll definitely be time at the end um, for any specific questions people may have. Uh, the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, um, we've been around, this will be our, uh, we'll be taking our 24th cohort in the Young Scholars Program. So we, we've been around about 24 years in terms of the Young Scholars Program and the overall foundation. Um, this is our mission statement here um, that we're dedicated to advancing the education of exceptionally promising students who have financial need. And so we're at that intersection of um, really, really promising high potential students. And again, we'll talk more about what financial needs when we talk about eligibility and criteria. I'm gonna dive into the Young Scholars Program experience um, and what it looks like a little bit more. Um, just to note, I'll bring all of these up that um, Young Scholars, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, come into the program um, applying as seventh graders and then actually entering the program as eighth graders. And then they remain in the program for from eighth grade all the way through 12th grade. Um, in terms of overall foundation, just to backtrack a little bit, we also have a college scholarship program and a graduate scholarship program. So for students who um, do finish with us from our Young Scholars program, they are eligible to then apply into those programs as well. But if you're here today for the Young Scholars program, um, and to learn more about that. And so these three components, um, personalized educational advising, um, we'll talk about it a little bit more, financial support, so actually getting funding to participate in certain things. And, and a big um, component for us is the scholar community um, and how we bring in students as a cohort um, from across the country. And I will note that, that we're a nationwide program. And so we take students from um, all across the country. Um, and there'll be a little bit more about eligibility again in terms of that. One of the biggest pieces of being a young scholar is that every young scholar has an educational advisor who is assigned to them. Um, our educational advisors um, have about 34 to 35 students with about five to seven students in each grade. 
the idea is that once a student comes in at eighth grade, they will likely stay with that advisor through 12th grade. They're there to be a supporter of the young scholar in collaboration with the people that they have in their family, in their community. And you'll see this list here, things like <clears throat> helping them choose the high school that's the best fit for them, um, helping with you know, high school class planning, with goal setting when it comes to their academics and their extracurricular activities. Um, one of the biggest pieces is we call them individualized learning plans. That's the funding and then the goals that go with it that a student will actually engage in while they're in our program. Advisors spend a good chunk right now, actually February through April, planning for the next school year <clears throat> with the student and their family. And then the advisor also helps facilitate um, group programming that we do. Um, for each grade level, they do about five to six virtual hangouts um, around academics, around social emotional things, um, and goal setting topics like that as they um, are going throughout high school. Um, and then they also help scholars plan for which summer programs they'll attend, which is something I'll talk about when we talk about funding a little bit more in the experience. The scholarship support, so that's the actual funding. Um, we're a little bit different than maybe what people think of as a traditional scholarship within the Young Scholars Program in that we directly pay for everything that might be funded for a student. So we're doing everything that um, would be considered sort of educational related. Um, so all of our students participate in summer programs um, and those are residential summer programs each summer. Things like online courses, community college classes, music lessons, art lessons, computers, calculators, printers. Um, lots of our students attend um, competitions, everything from math competition to science Olympiad to history day. And then some of our students also participate in internships during the year and throughout the summer that we might help fund them to be able to do. Um, this is just kind of a sampling of the kind of things we, we support, um, but they work with their advisor, like I said before, to set up what we might do while they're in the program each year. And every year might look a little bit different for each student as they go throughout high school. We've built a pretty robust community experience um, within the Young Scholars Program. And so these, when someone enters the programs, these are the things that they'll participate in as a young scholar. The first is something we call Welcome Weekend. Um, all young scholars get to come with a parent or guardian or sometimes a supporter, might be a teacher to someone to come with them. And they do a um, four day residential experience. We actually just had it um, last month in February. This coming cohort will actually be doing it in November we, um, in Virginia. They come together to learn more about the program, um, to meet our other staff, um, and to meet everybody else in their cohort, right? To get to know each other, spend time together, and also kind of prepare a little bit to head into high school. Um, but the biggest thing is to learn more about the program. I do want to note that um, advisors will also visit their new young scholars in the fall. Um, they'll visit them in their community and at their home to get to know them better. And that will typically happen before welcome weekend. The summer after eighth grade, before ninth grade, all of our scholars attend what we call first summer. And that's a um, two to three week residential summer experience that they all do together. So this summer we'll be at um, the College of William and Mary. And they'll be there together for two weeks doing um, a program called the Optimus Project there. Um, they'll be spending time at William & Mary, and then they'll also be spending a little bit of time in D.C. for that summer program experience. The summer between 11th and 12th grade, we have a group program called Senior Summit, which is also a residential summer experience. It's three weeks long, and it's focused on college search, application process, and financial aid from our standpoint, but our summer program partner, which will be at the University of Connecticut, and we have been for many years, um, they actually take place, they take part in a mentoring and research project. So they usually do that at least in two or sometimes bigger groups of three, four, five with either a professor or a graduate student um, there at the university. 
It's an amazing experience. Um, they've been doing it for a long while and it gives our students a chance to come back together as a cohort, gain some valuable research skills before they head off to college. The in between summers, I will note in 10th and 11th grade, our students also attend residential summer programs that again are about three weeks long. And we have um, usually five to six or seven partners that we're working with. And students will go in groups of anywhere in between seven to 20 to 25 um, scholars at a time. Those vary from the University of California at Summer, Santa Barbara to Carleton College. We usually offer one to two abroad programs. Um, this summer we'll actually be doing three different abroad programs in Peru, Japan, and Ghana. And so that kind of varies from summer to summer, but the expectation is that every single summer scholars will be participating in something together. And sometimes that's a large group and sometimes that's in a smaller group. I noted this earlier and we'll note it again that young scholar seniors are age able to and eligible to apply for our Cook College Scholarship. Um, some people might be aware and familiar that we have an external college scholarship that is open up nationwide, but we also have a route that's from young scholar to college scholar that um, is available to our young scholars. And so that award, you can see the details here, um, is last dollar funding after they apply for financial aid and can provide as much as 50, up to $55,000. So that's kind of long-term for what we do. And I mentioned too, we also have a graduate scholarship that's only open internal to people who finish with us at their in their college scholarship. Probably one of the reasons you're here is to learn more about who's eligible to apply um, just um, for the program. And the answers to that is that you have to be a current seventh grader. And so you will be starting eighth grade in the fall that you're accepted. Um, Unfortunately, if someone skipped a grade and they're now an eighth grader or say ninth grader, they wouldn't be eligible to apply. So you have to be currently in seventh grade. Um, people often ask about what are the grade requirements. Almost all of our finalists are going to have almost all A's in their core academic subjects since they've been in middle school. Some students have obviously maybe taken more advanced classes than others, but they're going to have mostly A's. Um, you do have to reside in a U.S. or U.S. territory and plan to attend high school in the U.S. And then the financial question, which is important, right, because we, we are based on financial need, is that we do have an eligibility marker of that you can have a maximum annual gross family income of up to $95,000. What you will note here is that particular consideration is given to candidates who have an annual gross income below $65,000. Um, our average, for people to be aware, our average right now of our families hovers somewhere around $35,000. So that's why you'll see that the particular consideration is given to candidates who are there below $65,000. So that is based on taxes, and you'll see here unmet financial need that you might have for other things. Our selection criteria is based on academic achievement, persistence, and leadership. Academic achievement is a pretty broad area, we realize. <laughs> and so our application, um, you'll see here in a minute, it involves a decent amount of writing, um, demonstrating curiosity, um, creativity. And so there's lots of different ways to do that. I do like to point out that um, with the leadership component, we're all, we're obviously talking about seventh graders. And so not everyone needs to necessarily be the president or, of a club or have founded a club, but it may be shown through other ways. For example, within your family, maybe, you know, that student is in charge of babysitting a younger sibling. And so that's how they really spent their time being a leader within their family. They might not have necessarily had time. Um, or the opportunity to do extracurricular activities. So a lot of these, we realize they can be demonstrated in different ways. So if you're thinking about how to have a student um, make that come across, 
then that might be something to think about. The application is a little bit long. I always kind of try to warn people. And so it's good to maybe as you're thinking about a student or helping students apply, what this is a good application checklist of what you'd wanna have sort of ready to go and ready to do to complete the application. So the first thing is a student would have to fill out their information, um, just basic information of demographics, um, where they're attending school, things like that, kind of the easier things. Um, parent guardian information. We do, and you'll note later, we talk about a self-reported AGI. Eventually we require financial information from anyone who's living in the household. So whether that's both parents and or if parents are in a different situation, there's two different households, they will still need to um, have that info, you know, financial information from both parents. Um, or whoever is their legal guardian is what I will say. They will need report cards from sixth and seventh grade. And so usually that can be shown through, you know, one transcript if they've been at two different schools, um, going ahead and getting that so they're able to turn in all of their grades. They will need recommendations from two teachers. Um, and so that's from two teachers who have taught them. And so kind of going ahead and maybe thinking about asking someone and the student thinking about who would be the best people to write that. There is an activities, honors, and awards section. Um, it's a pretty open section. And so that gives a student, like I said, that's where they can list things that people might think as more of the traditional um, ways to show persistence or leadership or their academic abilities, but there'll be op there's open space to do that. And then the writing portion, which I had mentioned earlier, three short responses and one essay that there will be application prompts for. Um, the short answers are um, kind of vary and just ask students to draw upon, you know, examples to tell us about themselves. That's what I always tell students. We want to know about you. So the more that your written responses can tell us about you and the kind of student you are, um, the kind of learner you are, and the kind of community member that you will be as part of the Young Scholars Program, the better that will help us know if you're a great fit for our program. Um, the longer essay does ask them to demonstrate partly that they can write a longer piece of writing. Um, and those prompts are actually available right now. The application is open. So anyone can start an application and go in and look at them and see what they wanted to do. The last piece you'll see down here is a self-reported AGI from the last three tax years. So that's partly so we can look at um, the situation over a slightly longer um, period of time to see where an, an adjusted gross income might land. Um, but that's the piece you'll have to do initially for the application. So having all these together, you don't necessarily have to do it in one sitting, but it is good to sort of know where you're headed with your application as you're doing it, <laughs> is what I would say. If you look on here, um, this is kind of the idea of how can you stay connected to us? There's a lot more to know about our program. So you can see here the link to our Young Scholars Program info. That can give you a better idea just of expanding on some of the things I talked about, like the advisor, the kind of things we fund, um, kind of what our current students look like. You can also get on one of our email lists if you want to be updated about things. And then you'll see our um, social media handles here. That gives you a better sense of the foundation of a, as, as a whole about our other programs. Um, we just had a lot posted about Welcome Weekend. So it's a great time to see what's in there, what we're doing. And then um, we are on LinkedIn, but the biggest piece probably here is that if you have any questions about actually the application or applying to the Young Scholars Program that maybe you don't get answered today or that are really specific to you or to one of your applicants, then you can email us at scholarships at jkcf.org. I'll note down here at the bottom before we take 
start taking questions that we usually announce our um, newest cohort in early fall. So for us, that means in August, um, the question people always ask is how many scholars are you taking? And so we're typically taking between 50 to 60 scholars in a cohort. We don't have any um, caps on, you know, necessarily how many we're taking. We're not taking one person from every state. So no need to worry that you'd be the only person from a certain place who might make it through. We are trying to kind of spread out throughout the country and to have a lot of diversity um, in many different ways. And so um, that's how we'll arrive at our 50 to 60 scholars. So going to stop there um, and hopefully take some questions. Yes. And thank you so much, June. This is such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I really like that students not only have that academic and extracurricular support, but they have opportunities to meet other students as well, which is really exciting. Uh, since June shared a lot of great information with us, we figured you might have some questions and, and we've had some really good ones come in the chat. So I'm going to be selecting some questions that you've already submitted. Please don't stop. Uh, please keep giving us your questions in, in the Q&A and we will answer them as best we can. And if we don't get that to them today, don't worry. We will be including answers to the questions that we didn't get to in that follow-up email. So let's get started with our first question. And that is, you mentioned that the beginning grade level is seventh grade. Can a current ninth grader apply for the program? Yeah, good question. So unfortunately, the answer is no. So you have to be a current seventh grader to apply. Um, if you are a ninth grader, what I will say, I did mention that our college scholarship, our external college scholarship, it is open to current 12th graders. I realize that's a long ways away from ninth grade, but it kind of gives you the heads up that our college scholarship is open nationwide um, right now. And so if you miss the opportunity to apply in seventh grade, there is a sort of second checkpoint there that you can apply to our college scholarship program when you're in 12th grade. But unfortunately, you have to be a seventh grader to be able to apply to young scholars. Thank you, June. And thank you for sharing those additional opportunities too. So we have another question. If income were to change while the student is already admitted to the program, would they be removed? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the, the short answer is probably no. <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of, it depends. So our entry adjusted gross income that I mentioned a couple of times is 95,000. Um, obviously, sometimes things get a lot better, right? And so people are, their income increases and that's great that we want that to happen for people. Um, what may end up happening is that within our program, how we do our funding is that people who are sometimes kind of dependent on financial aid they're receiving, maybe to go to a school or something else, um, but they might have a lower adjusted gross income, they may be getting more from us depending on what they need. As someone with higher income, we may be cost sharing with their families to do some of our funding. Um, so if your income went over the 95,000, you would not automatically get kicked out, but then we might look at what we're funding and what makes sense based on the increase. Um, it may come just because I mentioned the college, college scholarship that we keep the families updated as to if they're still eligible based on their income level to apply for our college scholarship. So typically what it is, is you'll still have the advising, still can, you know, participate in our summer program, but you might be getting less funding if your income were to increase, you know, slightly or some while you're in the program. Thank you, June. So I have a question um, on whether or not this webinar is being recorded. Yes. It is being recorded. And so if you signed up for this webinar, we are automatically going to email you a copy of the recording, as well as the answers to any questions that we didn't get to. Um, if you did not sign up for the webinar, uh, you were able to, to come to the webinar without signing up, you are welcome to email me and I will send you a copy of it. And my email is ciayala at avid.org. So it's C A Y. A L A at avid.org. Anyway, we have some more questions. This, this question is coming from a student. I went to a school where sixth grade is in elementary school 
and in the application, it talked about how the teacher is needed to teach me for two years. How would that happen? So, so, so just getting more, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. It's a great question. I, I don't, um, think it doesn't, I'll, I'll make sure with our team, it's that they, they don't necessarily need to teach you for two years. I will say that you do need two teacher recommendations, which might be the confusing part. Um, but if you went to, um, there's a lot of elementary schools like that, right, where they go through sixth grade, that is perfectly fine um, to get a, a sixth grade teacher to complete it. So you might have one sixth grade teacher and then another seventh grade teacher. Um, I really encourage people to think about, um, do they know you well right now so that it kind of matches up to the person you are now? So that's why I say you might have a sixth grade and a seventh grade. You might have two seventh grade, but they don't need to have taught you for two years. Thank you for that. Um, and if you need additional information around your question, our, um, our, our student who asked that, you're welcome to reach out to Jack Kent Cook Foundation or myself. We're, we're here to help you and we want to uh, make sure if, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to us. So our, our next question is, this program offers great opportunities. I agree. <laughs> what are some of the safety measures taken during the summer programs when the minors are away from home? That's a great question. Parents always, we talk about this with our own um, families a lot. We were just doing this at Welcome Weekend. Um, so one thing to note is that we run all our programs with summer program partners who've gone through a pretty rigorous process of applying to be a partner with us. So um, we just went through the process for this kind of next cycle. We do about a three-year cycle um, where we had about 30 to 40 programs apply to be a partner with us. And, and based on their own application process, they became a summer program partner. So the one thing to note is that they've done that. And part of that is telling us what are their safety precautions on campus? How will students be housed? What's their ratio? What will they do when they go off campus? Um, you know, all of those kind of things. Because most of our programs are at colleges, except for our broad program, um, a lot of that is very dependent on the college and the college itself also within the program will offer what their safety measures are. So that's something we try to do at a very like specific program level. So for instance, our eighth grade parents got to hear and meet the staff from William and Mary at Welcome Weekend because that's where they're headed. And then for our 10th and 11th graders and our 12th graders, we do virtual fairs for every single program where parents can come attend, they can ask questions. The programs can talk more about what they're going to do in terms of um, hiring their staff, and the training they do and like the safety precautions that they take. So um, abroad programs, we, I think that's the one that people have the most questions about in terms of safety precautions, but we've worked with uh, both the abroad programs we work with now, one has been in business for almost 60 years and I don't want to give years for the other one. So they've long been, um, you know, running programs and we feel um, good about what they're doing. So. Thank you for that. I, I know a lot of parents out there wondering, they often have that question. So yeah, for thank sure. you for, for sharing information about that. So one, one of our attendees is wanting to know a little bit more about eligibility based on the fact that the student is on a U.S. Air Force base outside of the U.S. So are you able to talk a little bit more about eligibility yeah, with relation we, to being out yeah, of the country? We had prepped for this a little bit. So it's a good question. Um, so technically speaking, you are eligible. I think having those details that you mentioned there that they be going to high school in the U.S. is really helpful. I mentioned earlier, if you heard me say that um, our advisors go visit um, students in the eighth grade. So that kind of also would be, you know, is this the right fit for what we're able to do? But coming to high school in the U.S. during um, their time in the program would make a difference. So my suggestion is to, if you're in a very unique situation like that, as you're applying to reach out to our scholarships um, email address there and let them know, you can obviously do it through your application, but let them know you're kind of in a unique situation of where you are and if that would be um, you know, taken into consideration. Thank you, June. That's that's helpful if, if you feel like it, it, your situation's very unique, always check in with the Jack Kent Cook Foundation and, and touch base with them and let them know. Thank you for that. So, 
uh, one of our attendees is wanting to know, where do I go to download the application? And I, I can actually answer that one for anyone, <laughs> anyone who is an AVID student. Uh, we would love for you to go to www.jkcf.org slash AVID. So that is specifically for AVID students, or if you are at an AVID school, uh, you might not be an AVID student, but you might be at an AVID school, um, please go ahead and access the application through that site. I know we might have a couple individuals joining us today who um, you might have heard about this webinar from Jack Kent Cook directly, and you don't have an affiliation to AVID. So I'm going to let June take it away on where to apply if you are not uh, at an AVID school. Yeah, if you're not in the AVID school, you should just be able to go directly to our website there. Um, and then and then the link would be in there. Again, if you're having any problems, you can certainly email us, but you should be able to go right there. Um, you can go to jkcf.org and it'll actually, you know, there's it'll you can even get right in there. So thank you. Um so one of our attendees is wondering, will cost of living be taken into consideration when looking at income as some states and cities are more expensive than others? Yeah, it's a great question. So that's part of the reason we have the 95,000, which to some people sounds a little bit high and why we say the 65,000 is sort of more in line. And I mentioned the 35,000 of being the average. We go all the way up to 95,000 because we do take that to consideration, right? Size of family, um, cost of living, someone living in, for instance, New York City in Manhattan versus someone who might be living in a more rural place. So all those things are taken into consideration, although you still do have to self-report if you're under the 95,000. Um, again, sometimes people will ask if they're maybe one year they were over the 95 and then two years they were under since it's, you know, three years back, you can certainly go ahead and self-report that to see if you would still be eligible. Thank you. So we have some questions around grades. I know that's, that's always a big topic. Um, so if the grades are mostly A's, but then some B's, can the student be considered? And then are C grades acceptable for this program? Yeah, so definitely A's with some B's, yes, definitely, you know, go ahead and apply. And I, I mean, I always encourage you really to show in your writing wh what you're curious about, what, you know, it, uh, there's chances in there to talk about, like, maybe something has been a challenge. I mean, getting a B, I always tell people and we tell our own stars, B's are fine. So there's no reason, you know, to think like, that's the worst thing that could ever happen. So that's not it. Um, but certainly, um use your application to the fullest extent of the ability, right? Because it's not just your grades. What I'll say to the C's question is, I mentioned that most of our finalists will have almost all A's. And like I said, they might have a B or B's here and there. So with the C's, it's just a lot harder, I think, to make it through to the very end, knowing that you're up against a lot of students who have really, really high grades and might be in more advanced classes. Um, I will say if you have a C, I would still encourage you to think about, could I put, you know, my best foot forward? Um, or if you have, maybe you, you got a C in an advanced classes, uh, people often ask middle school report cards a little bit different sometimes than high school report cards because they show all your grades sometimes. So maybe you got a B or a B plus or an A minus at the, by the end of the year, but maybe you got a C you know, for your quarter grade or something, I would still encourage you to, you know, put it, put your best foot forward and put your full application, see what can you do. But I do like to be honest with people that it's pretty hard to make it to those last 50 or 60, um, depending on grades like that. Thank you. So I have a couple questions about the summer programs. And one of them is, what is the summer program? And I know we talked about that a little bit already, but uh, for anyone joining us a little bit late or um, anyone who needs a, a little more detail on the summer program, are you able to share some some more quick, quick facts about yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. Everybody always wants to know. So... The program that, um, that they do for first summer at William and Mary is uh, based around, um, if anybody knows anything about William and Mary, it's a lot of um, sort of live history and interactive history that they do down there. It's a mix. Um, they're kind of doing a mix of 
history and sociology and different groups of peoples that were there in Williamsburg over time and studying them and then doing some group presentations. So kind of nebulous way to describe that one. But the other programs I can tell you, our program at Santa Barbara, that's our summer program, um, is, is also a summer research program and students have different track in mostly STEM, but they also have a few humanities that they're doing um, for that program. Our abroad programs are a mix. So sometimes they end up uh, being a language program, um, which is usually no prior knowledge of language needed. So like our Japanese program, for instance, in Japan is a language program. Um, whereas our program in Peru is more of a cultural program. And our program in Ghana is actually an internship experience. They're working with some organizations there. All of the abroad programs, everybody stays with a host family, usually with one other scholar. So that's part of the experience too, is kind of do like cultural immersion. And then um, Carleton College, our other summer program partner um, here in the US is um, they also have a number of tracks. They have a neuroscience track, a more writing humanities track, another STEM one and a history one. Um, and then finally, uh, Siegel, which is a, actually a semester boarding school in Washington, D.C., they do an ethics and leadership program. And so students study debate and public speaking and kind of everything Washington, D.C. during the summer that they're there. And then I think I mentioned Senior Summit, our last program, is more of a mentoring program. And the subjects are wide. <laughs> so we have everybody doing everything from math research to electrical engineering to puppetry um, to, I'm trying to think, uh, one of our students worked on research and actually found like her own species of coral. So doing like a more biology um, related thing. So that one really runs the gamut. Um, and some of that are things that students were interested in to begin with. And some of it is things that they knew nothing about when they got there. And so um, that kind of gives you an idea of the summer programs. Sounds like the possibilities are endless, really. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Very exciting. So uh, the another question that we had that was related to the summer programs are, are there options for students whose parents are not comfortable with them traveling with strangers? Yeah, so it's a great question. So try to be real forthright and honest with this is that we do expect students to attend residential summer programs. It's one of the reasons we do Welcome Weekend first so that a parent and or guardian can come with their student and meet our staff first, meet the staff from their very first summer program. But the expectation after that is that all of our students will go to first summer for the first three weeks um, and then attend their summer programs after that. And so for some people, that's not something that's a great fit for them. And that's OK. Then that might that might mean for you that our program is not a great fit. There's other programs where there isn't a summer requirement. But for us, summer is a requirement and it is something we ask people as we get kind of further along in the process um, as people become finalists, if they're okay with that. So it's a good question. Yeah, definitely. I, there are so many good questions. I am loving all these that are coming in. So please, if you have more questions, keep, keep them coming. So here is one that's asking a little bit about what, what the scholarship covers. And, and the question is how often does the program pay for a private high school? Yeah, so great. That's a great question. So um, our students, one great thing to know is that about 60% of our young scholars go to a public school. So that might mean their local public school. It might, might mean a magnet public school that they've applied into a charter school that they were already attending or they lotteried into. And then about 40% of them go to some kind of private school. About half of the 40% go to a day school, meaning they just go there during the day, kind of like a more traditional school. And about half of them go to a boarding school, meaning they live at that school. And so that's why you'll see so often do we pay for private school? The answer kind of is um, sometimes and for those students who are doing that. Our students apply for what we call a last dollar scholarship. So that means that they apply for financial aid first through their private school. And then we usually are chatting and having conversations with the private schools they're considering. And then we will look at what's not covered and with their advisor, with the family, with the school, we'll decide, okay, we can make this work and are able to support that. I, our average, which I'm happy to share that we spend for 
private school, which people are usually shocked by, is usually only between about four thousand to six thousand dollars across the board, and that's because most of our students are receiving very generous financial aid to go. So. Our role is really to try to cover all those things that maybe aren't covered at school. And so that's why the schools are usually really willing to work with us to be able to cover those other things um, that would be in it. So, yeah. And once we do that, kind of to the question of how often, I mean, once a student goes to school, obviously the commitment is that they would stay at that school as long as that's a good fit for them throughout high school. So. Thank you, June. Very, very helpful to know. And I have another question. We're, we're coming back to grades. I know that's a big topic that we we've gone into. Um, and th this is a this is an interesting um, new question about grades. So my child currently goes to a school that does not grade A, B, C, et cetera. Do you have a conversion chart for non letter grades? Absolutely. So we get well, since we're a nationwide program, we get every kind of school you can imagine. We get home schools, we have private schools, we have schools without grades, schools without with grades, schools with A's, schools with one through 12, <laughs> schools with A, B, C, D, you know, more traditional. So we have, we have a conversion chart. We will, <clears throat> usually the school actually with the school report that they have to do for us, they will usually send something that has it. And if not, we reach out to them to make sure that we have the correct chart. So I always tell people there's no reason to fret. Um, and this is kind of a gateway to the college process too. We're just like college admissions officers. We convert everything so that everybody kind of has a level playing field for what's being offered at the school and how they grade it. Wonderful. So don't, don't be discouraged yeah, if you, no if your school has a very unique grading system, Jack Kent Kick, Cook will work with you. So <laughs> uh, please apply. Uh, so we had someone share that they have a, a pretty unique situation as far as uh, finances and um, just how how finances are shared between the um, the parents. And so if someone does have a really unique situation as far as finances, how, how would they be able to communicate that information either on the application or in a separate place so that uh, they could... Um, work, work through that to determine if they're eligible. Yeah. So the application has a pretty good amount of, you know, options to choose from, I will say. And it does also have some open-ended space for financial information additions that you could write in. So I would certainly, just like I tell the students, for the parents to use that application to the fullest extent to explain and then you're always welcome to follow up with our scholarships email to let them know what you've submitted. And if you feel like there wasn't space in the application to adequately describe your situation, you can always, you know, email them, say, could I send this? Could I send this addendum? Could I send this additional information? Sometimes they'll ask for it, but it's always good to be proactive, especially if you already feel like your situation is pretty unique and you want to make sure that it is explained fully. Thank you, June. And, and kind of along those same lines, does financial eligibility include combined parent incomes? I think you may have mentioned it earlier, but um, just, just to reiterate, does, does it include combined parent incomes? It does include combined parent incomes. Okay. And if you have more, you know, kind of, I think what people might be wondering too, if you, um, if parents are separated or divorced or never married or, you know, whatever the situ situation may be, um, then you can ask is what I would say. <laughs> so we're going to require, you know, any parent who is you know, claiming the student, or like I said, if someone lives in the household too, we'll be asking for information. So it's better to just go ahead and sort of, you know, be forthcoming, ask, say, here's, here's the people we have. How can we make sure that we have all that? But we do combined incomes. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. So we, we have another question about how to sign up for the summer program. So let's say you get you get accepted to the Jack Kent Cook Young Scholars Program. How, how does signing up for the summer program work? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll reiterate that we don't have our own summer program that's outside of Young Scholars Program. So just in case anybody is wondering that, I wish we did, but we don't. Um, 
But um, the way we do it is everyone goes to first summer, which is that summer after eighth grade, and everyone goes to the summer after 11th grade. So they are registering and choosing maybe like the mentorship, you know, they're going to do and putting in some stuff like that. For the summer when they have choices, um, we actually do, a like I said, a big virtual fair where all of our summer program partners come. And then students actually complete a survey where they list their top choices and the reasons why they want to do what they want to do. And then we kind of place everybody where they're going to go. So seniority matters a little bit. Um, <laughs> so sometimes if you don't get to go where you want to go that first summer um, after ninth grade, you might go the next summer. Um, but usually any, everybody ends up at a great experience. So there is some choice um, to an extent and then a little bit of placement to an extent as well. Thank you. So I wanted to answer one question that we get often. I, I get this question. I'm, I'm sure June uh, gets this too, is do you have to be an AVID student to apply? And I'm I'm happy to take that. Uh, the, the answer is no, you, you do not. Um, AVID promotes this opportunity to our, our different AVID schools and our AVID districts because it's a really really great opportunity and, and really uh, wonderful, wonderful um, experience for students. So we we promote this opportunity and, and do some outreach around it because it is really great. Um, but you do not have to be an AVID student to apply. You, you do not have to be at an AVID school or, or be within an AVID district to apply. So um, just wanted to make, make that clear. And... I will know that if you are an AVID student, there is a place on the application where you definitely do want to note, for Cindy also partly yeah. for AVID, um, that, you know, when you're applying that you are an AVID student. So don't forget to do that because sometimes yes. <laughs> Please do that. And June, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think it asks, how did you hear about yeah. the this opportunity? And then also, are, are you an AVID student? Which are oh. you in, an AVID student would be, um, are you in the AVID, AVID elective class? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And that's great for us because that helps us know we're getting the word, where we're getting the word out. So Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I have another question. Uh, how do you know if you're accepted? So how, uh, June, you mentioned the, the fall, um, I, or actually I think you mentioned August, which is yeah. getting into the fall, but um, how, how do students find out that they got into the program? Yeah, so we let everybody know either way. We send an email. Um, so even if you weren't accepted, we're going to let you know. And if you are, we will email and let you know. So like I said, that typically will happen in August um, for some people before the school year starts, but um, you will know. And we do have a um, semifinalist process too. So you might know along the way as well. So. Very exciting. Uh, so these, you all have the best questions. You, you are keeping them coming and I applaud you for that. So, uh, other question we have is, can we edit the parent form after submitting it? So my advice with that would be, that's a great question. I don't actually think you can edit your application once you've submitted, but you can certainly reach out to scholarships with what you need to edit. <laughs> Um, and, and they would either open it back up or just also add something that they would note what the edit should be, what it should be in there. So I don't think once you've hit submit that you have an opportunity to do that because it is submitted. Um, so that's my, my quick answer. So it sounds like if, if you have some questions on anything, maybe check with the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, sure. just, just to make sure that you're, you're submitting everything that you need to, and you've reported everything to the best of your knowledge. And um, just, just getting those questions answered ahead of time. If, if you have any kind of doubts or uh, lingering questions about that. It's like I tell the students, I wouldn't wait until the very last minute, because <laughs> I'm sure you can, everyone can imagine we get a lot of questions right there at the end. Um, yeah. So if you already have some questions, it's good to go ahead and ask them now. That way you don't rush. And like you said, then feel like maybe you need to edit it later. 
Yes, and, and that segues nicely into a, a quick plug for our application workshop that we have next week. So really encourage you to start on your applications now so that you can come to the workshop next week and we can help you with those questions that you're encountering on the application. So if you start this week, you, you can always have those questions in mind for when the application webinar is, oh, excuse me, application workshop is happening. And that's going to be on March 20th. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that in uh, the upcoming minutes, but I just wanted to throw that in there now so you can start thinking about attending attending that workshop, making making some time on your calendar if you're available. Um, so a couple, couple more questions here. We have a question around grades again, and uh, this this um, attendee is asking specifically, do you look at grades per quarter or per year? And what if the child is in advanced classes and AVID, but sometimes their grades fluctuate? Will that affect eligibility? So it's kind of like I said earlier, different schools have different ways that they do transcripts, but we see what we see, right? And so um, if we we would take into consideration, you know, a kind of a large fluctuation of grades. Obviously the final grade is the final grade. Um, and so, like I said, that there is a, a portion there where you can, in the application, you can certainly explain things. So I tell people, you know, that would be a great spot where maybe if your grades did fluctuate because you were sick, maybe you're out for a little while for that quarter, something happened that's a great place where you can, can show like, Hey, that was just a blip really, you know, while my final grade ended up being that. So there's an opportunity to do that, but you can certainly look at what the school is. You should be able to, when, you know, when you request your transcript, you can see what it's going to submit. Typically, if you are on a quarter system, you are going to report, you know, your quarter grades. Um, and that's how it will work versus maybe being on a semester system where you only got your grades for two semesters. Thank you for that. So I think this is our last question. So this, this I'm going to do one, one last call for questions. So if you have questions, put them in the Q&A now. And um, if we don't get any coming in, um, I will, we'll probably wrap up. But I'm going to go ahead and ask this one right here, thinking this is the last question, unless you all Add one more at the last minute. <laughs> so the question is, what do the students do during their eighth grade year? So I'm assuming, what what do you do with the program in, in eighth yeah, grade? I love that question. Um, eighth grade is actually a little bit different because um, one thing I didn't mention is students don't actually receive the same kind of funding during eighth grade. So everyone gets an individualized learning plan, but it doesn't actually start until ninth grade. Eighth grade is for us to really get to know you um, for you to get to know the program. And so then starting in ninth grade, you would actually get in your fun your funding. So eighth grade is a time for you to meet your advisor. Like I said, your advisor would come and meet you. Time for them to work with you and your family to um, figure out where you're going to go to high school <laughs> and what that means. Um, <clears throat> to get to know the other members of your cohort. So the eighth graders do virtual hangouts just like everybody else. Um, and one thing I didn't mention that's really cool is we actually have a partnership with Bard College. We do a writing course with them for all of our eighth graders. So during January and February, let's see, they're actually going through March, January, February, and March of um, eighth grade year, all of our students participate in about a six to eight week writing course together. So again, that's a chance to get to know each other um, as people and writers um, and do that. And so you have those opportunities um, leading up into your first summer that you would do together. Thank you so much, June. And this is going to be our last question. And uh, just, just a reminder, if you have more questions, we, uh, we are happy to answer them. We'll provide our contact information, but this will be our last one for this afternoon slash evening. So are extracurricular activities taken into account on eligibility, like sports and or drama or writing clubs? Definitely. That's what that, um, we talked about the honors, the awards, the activity section. There's a really big section where you can list the activities you do, what's most important to you, what your role is. And that's something we take into consideration when we talk about persistence and leadership and maybe even, and, and also obviously academic ability because maybe you're doing math counts or something or maybe you're doing quiz bowl um so 
that's why, again, I really encourage you just like we do to our own scholars to use the application to really show like, what is it that I do? What am I interested in? What I'm curious about? Um, and know that like every piece of the application allows you to do that. So if you don't talk about it in your short answer, there's maybe a place for it in the activity section. And I imagine that Avid, when they do the workshop, will help you figure out like, hey, where does that belong um, to help me the best in my application? Thank you for that. Yeah, we can dive more into that on the application workshop. As you mentioned, we can help find the, the perfect place to put that information. <laughs> so we are going to wrap up our webinar for today. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you so much for these really, really great questions. We know you may have had a long day, so it means a lot that you are here with us learning about this opportunity. And if you're watching the recorded webinar, we thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. I wanted to send a big thanks to June and the Jack Kent Cook Foundation team who makes the Young Scholars Program possible. And thank you, Erin, for your help with monitoring the chat and our question and answers. If you have questions, please visit the Jack Kent Cook Foundation's FAQ page, which is in the chat, or you can reach out to me or the Jack Kent Cook team. My email is cayala at avid.org. It's C-A-Y-A-L-A -A at avid.org. Or you can reach out to the Jack Kent Cook Foundation with their email being scholarships at jkcf.org. And we've included that information in the chat. As we mentioned, if you're looking for additional application help, AVID and the Center for Talent Development at Northwestern University are co-hosting an online workshop specifically for AVID students, educators, and families on March 20th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. We will go over the application and answer any questions you may have. So we encourage you to attend and have put that workshop information in the chat as well. So thank you again. And don't forget the application closes May 9th Good luck. Have a great day.